live from Music City, Nashville, Tennessee. This is your motivational, sensational, inspirational, educational, aspirational, international, keenly awaited, daily created, highly anticipated edition of the afternoon swing trading floor. Ah, just kidding. <laughs> this is your advanced trading program module number two. Folks and friends, team and family, fans, friends, and followers from around the entire world, welcome to your epic adventure of brain food and delicious, magnificent proportions of delectable, deliriously delightful stock market education. Eve says, good morning from Australia. Woo, good morning and good afternoon or good night, depending on where you are in the world. This is a global audience, folks, so thank you all for being here. I truly do appreciate it. Our mission is to enrich lives. We do that by guiding many people towards achieving fully and understanding financial freedom. That is our mission. And the module goal for this particular module is to learn about what calendar spreads are and how they work. You might remember from our last program together that we discussed spreads. We talked a little bit about them. You now know that a spread is something that has two option legs in it. And we're going to talk more about spreads in this particular module. Some really quick stuff about me. Here are some of my mentors in life. I get to be graced by one of them tonight, Mr. Matt DeLong. He's uh, one of my best friends, business partner, and fellow cerebral pyromaniac. Dennis Dick, one of my trading mentors, has been in the game for a very long time and uh, love that dude. And the rest of the people are just people that I read everything that they create, watch every video that they make, listen to as many things as I can to just gleam some insights from them. A lot of people ask, who are my mentors? How do I learn? This is that list. Also, here's a list of some of my favorite books. I did not include my books because that just seemed a little over the top. So some of my favorite motivational books, that was specifically a question that I got, was what are some of my favorite motivational books? So You Are a Badass at Making Money by Jen Sincero is a must read. You Can't Hurt Me by the man, the myth, the legend, David Goggins. Be Obsessed or Be Average by Grant Cardone and Never Split the Difference. All four of those books, very good motivational books. Also had a trader ask me, best single trade that I've ever done. Uh, Apple Calls, July 27th, 2016. <laughs> that was a uh, very nice gap. Might talk about later today at some point, I'm sure, but really, really nice one. And a dream vacation spot for me is Bali, Indonesia. That is upcoming and is on the list. I just don't know exactly what day that's going to happen, but that is going to be happening sometime in the next two calendar years for sure. One other small achievement, ladies and gentlemen, just finished one of the, speaking of David Goggins, one of his challenges. I felt like it was a personal challenge directly to me. The four by four by 48. We talked about it last night uh, in the last program. And that is where you run four miles every four hours for 48 hours, which equates to 48 miles. So I just finished mile 48 about seven minutes ago, and now I'm here. <laughs> and to make it a little bit harder, I didn't tell other people because I, I think people would think I'm a little crazy, but uh, my diet consisted of only fruits and nuts, just to make it a little bit harder. So I've been eating a lot of cherries, blackberries, strawberries, grapes, uh, pistachios, and that's pretty much been my diet for the last 48 hours. So loving it, feeling good, fired up, ready to enrich lives with each and every one of you. Woo, I love it. Now, just in case you all want the slides to this presentation, uh, the slides were helped edited and made awesomely pretty by Miss Robin Steckel, who is here right now. I'm one of her biggest fans. She has a podcast called You Can Do Anything. You should check it out. Make sure to do anything and everything that Robin Steckel does, as well as her mom, Yvonne. So Yvonne and Robin, thank you for being here. I love both of you. But if you do want the slides, Feel free to text Newsome to 55444, or if you live in Canada, text Newsome to 
three five five zero. Mm-mm. Edward says, Robin getting a shout out. Yes. She's put in so much work to become great at this trading stuff. I mean, I would argue the more you put into anything, the more results you will get out of it. And I just love seeing people dive full force into anything and getting something great out of it. Here's where we are, my dear friends. Module two, what are calendar spreads and how to implement them? Module three, going to talk about earning strategies, iron condors, straddles and strangles and gaps. Module four, going to be discussing long-term investing, right, Mr. Matalong? And then module five is Elliott Wave and Fibonacci analysis, plus a recaps and quizzes and Q&A, stuff like that. Yeah. And here we go. Just to remind everyone, I have taught this particular class before, except it was a little bit less budget friendly, <laughs> a little, little bit more budget friendly, I should say. And it's called How to Trade the Calendar Spread. So if you are watching this and you want to go all the way back five years ago to when I first taught this class, you're welcome to do so and check it out. Go into Google, into YouTube, whatever, and search How to Trade the Calendar Spread, real life trading. And uh, this presentation will be better. <laughs> but that is something that you can check out if you want to. Now, the term calendar spread is also called a diagonal spread. Both of those terms can be used interchangeably. There's also the term that's thrown around out there pretty often, the poor man's covered call. So if you hear one of those three terms, that's really what we're talking about because remember, a calendar spread can be a debit or a credit spread. So a debit spread means you're paying for it and a credit spread means you are receiving money for it. So just a little bit of an FYI. So again, calendar spreads can be debit spreads or credit spreads. Bottom line, you have two totally different expiration dates. That's what makes a calendar spread a calendar spread is that it has different expiration dates. Now, I wanted to cover this early because this might sound a little shocking to you, but when I first started learning this stuff years and years and years ago, I didn't learn this particular bullet right here with the big red arrow. I had to learn it the hard way. So I'll tell you now, this is a very important piece of this entire program and class and module. The biggest risk with doing a calendar spread is if your short option expires in the money, your long option will not cover you. So for example, if you do covered calls, right, you have shares and a short call option. And if that short call option expires in the money, your shares will cover you because you just simply sell your shares. But if you are in a long option and you have a short option against it and it expires in the money, stuff will happen to your account. Let's go talk about it. Let's go through a few examples and kind of talk about how this whole process works. Now, I wanted to potentially build this out so that they all kind of came in as like an, an animated thing, but I decided against it for this particular class. <laughs> so here's a question just to repeat, my dear friends. Number one, is selling puts bullish? All I need is yes or no. Is selling puts bullish all right so we have a no from one trader the rest are saying yes we have one no so we have two no's and the rest are yeses so again if you came to the last module which is module one you will know that selling puts is indeed bullish it's a bullish strategy so let's kind of talk through this particular put sale right here that we're looking at and this one is if you are selling a August 150 put. So look at where we are present day. So we're in February. Whoa, whoa, Newsom, whoa. If we're in February and we're selling an August put, this goes against everything you just said in the last class that you do. That is correct. I generally, generally don't do the specific strategy unless I just have a lot of extra money lying around and a lot of patience on a particular stock. I can. I have done it before. It's not something I implement all the time, 
But some traders really love these particular strategies that we're going to be talking about in this class, and they do work, and I do like them, and I do understand them. So I figured I'll explain them to you. So if we sold a 150 August put, we all agree that August is pretty far away from February. And then if you wanted to, you bought a March 145 put as protection. This would be called a calendar bull put spread. Now, can someone remind me, why is it called a calendar? It's called a calendar because it has two different expiration dates. Yep, two different expiration dates. So one of them is August and the other is March. Would you receive a credit for this particular trade, ladies and gentlemen, yes or no? Yes, you would. So money would come into your account. Why? Well, simply put that the August 150 put has more time, therefore it will cost more. So if you sell something that costs a lot of money, you bring in a lot more money. If you buy something that does not cost that much money, you have a credit, you have a difference. That's simply why. The August has more time value, therefore it's more valuable to sell. Does this trade require margin? Yes, it does. Wow, high five team. Very, very nice. All right, next question, Chief. If you sold this trade in February, could you buy it back anytime you wanted to? Yes or no? The answer is yes, you could. And again, you can buy a lower put as a short-term protection just in case. That's kind of already what we did in this example. Now, if I'm also looking at this particular trade, um, if we got into this trade at market open, I'll kind of point to the black candle uh, right here. If you got into that particular trade at market open, was Apple down at that time? And the answer is actually, yes, it was. The answer is yeah. It was down at market open because you'll notice that the previous day closed here at the black line. And then the next day's market opened, opened down here at the green line. So at open, Apple was a down day. So initially, again, if you're getting into a longer term trade, I do like selling these trades at open, especially if the stock is down. You'll notice that obviously you had a perfect hammer candle and a really good one white soldier candle and then a nice bullish candle following it. So you would assume that it's likely going to continue a little bit higher. But you could have sold it at open because at the time, Apple was a down from, you know, from open. All right, cool. So it bounces. We can all see that Apple bounces. That's pretty much, that's pretty nice. So what we're doing now is we've traded a few days in the future. And now we've gone from mid-February to early March, let's say March 5th. My dear friends, at this point, does it seem like the 145 March put will expire worthless? What do you all think? Nice. So you're all getting this. This is good. This is really good. And again, if you have questions, let me know. I'm happy to answer them at any point in time. So as a reiteration, could you also at this point buy to close the August short put if you wanted to? And the answer is obviously, yes, you could. I mean, if it meets your plan, if, you, if you're up on it, could you wait? And the answer is, yeah, obviously, of course you could wait because it's only been two and a half, three weeks. Now, here's what's cool. At this point, we talked about this recently as well. Could you also sell a bear call spread? And the answer is yes, you could. 
Good. How many check marks would you get selling a bear call spread? I will walk you through them. But in the other class, most recent module, we talked about looking for and trying to get as many check marks as you possibly can. So check mark number one, you're at a resistance. So it could go lower. Check mark number two, you have a pretty bearish candle with an upper shadow. So it could roll over. Check mark number three, you've already had a really, really massive town run up in the last few weeks. So it makes sense that Apple could pull back a little bit before going higher. I think that's it. <laughs> that's really all you could have. Three. Now that doesn't mean that you couldn't get in. It just simply states that if you did get in, if you got into a bear call spread up here and you were in a bull put spread down here, does anyone know what that strategy is called? So you're in a bull put spread in the bottom. And if you get into a bear call spread on top, you're now in an iron condor. We're going to talk more about that in the next class, but that's precisely when you do them. Now, going back and looking at it present day in hindsight, you're like, yeah, well, that seems really easy, Jeremy. Obviously, I would fill a bear call spread there. But again, even so, I probably personally would only do a short term one because we can obviously see that Apple is very, very bullish. And the only thing holding it back realistically is this resistance. That's it. Other than that, I'm a little sketchy on being super bearish on this particular chart at this moment. Because one of my rules stipulates to not try to pick the top on something, especially with a credit spread. Right? Do not try to pick the top on something with a credit spread. Don't say, oh, well, there's no way the stock can go this high. So let me get into a bear call spread because the stock has to drop. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Now we can see that it kind of would have somewhat worked if you did a bear call spread. It just really depends. But if you did a spread that was a little too tight like this, you'll notice that that spread would have gone in the money probably scared you, shook you out, and then it dropped, right? That's another reason why I have the rule in my plan that says I fully expect the stock to go into my spread at least one time. But nonetheless, let's go back to the example. If you did buy back your sold put, remember, you could have, we talked about doing that up here. We talked about buying back the sold put could you resell it again at this particular point in time? Yes or no? And the answer is, of course you could. Why not? So could you do the entire trade again a second time? August 150 put sale, and this time you sell a May 145. You buy one. Um, give me three seconds. Let me update that little note. Um, and a 145 put buy. There we go. So we'll put buy. Again, the put purchase is simply a protection. It's an insurance contract. Now, what time of the year are we in on this present candle? Can you guys read the charts on this one? Where are we at? So if we're looking at it, we're, yep, we're in early April on Apple at this point. So buying a 145 may put would just give you, you know, it would cost you some money, but it would more or less say, all right, awesome. Let's see if Apple doesn't really crumble in the next few weeks. And if it does, at least I have some protection so that I can, well, protect myself. And if not, then all is good. Now, the reason I thought I brought up the bear call spread thing, and this might be a shocking statement, but 80% of my credit spreads are bullish spreads. Is that shocking to anyone? <laughs> because I'm a perma bull and I'm smart. Now, again, I realize that at some point we're going to have a market where it does not dip. I actually fully, totally get that. And I think it's going to be the next one. The next big crash, I'm going to be a lot more patient. The next time when the Dow's like it, 45,000, 
and we have a bigger dip. I'll be a little more patient on that one. But regardless, either way, most of my credit spreads are bullish spreads. I do not pick the top very well on credit spreads. Now, again, you can make some money. And I did make a lot of money on Tesla recently betting against it two or three times on the downside. But bottom line, most of my spreads are bullish. A little, little takeaway. Now, again, here's some names and some terminologies for what we're going to learn tonight. Here's what you could also do. This is an example. Oop, hold on one second. This is an example of why you're here in class tonight. The calendar bull call spread, AKA the diagonal bull call spread, AKA the long call diagonal, AKA the poor man's covered call. Here's what we're about to learn. We talked about selling options. Selling options is a fun little strategy. It's cool. It's a limited return, limited return, high probability trade. Here's what I have found. In most of my personal option trading, I am and have a much higher win loss ratio on longer term options. Why is that Newsom? I guess guys, because I just suck at short term trading. I, I don't know why. <laughs> that's just my opinion that's just me okay that doesn't mean that anyone else has to be in that exact boat but when i'm looking at all my trades my long-term options if they have like nine months or more on expiration i win on 73 percent of them mark says it's your law of attraction in action boom baby so longer term i'm really really good at option trading arnold says it's a lot like long stock. Exactly. And I'm really good at long stock. I generally, I definitely, definitely, definitely have losses, but I do like playing directional options. So when I trade them, this particular strategy is a high reward, large ROI, lower, uh, I would say, I don't know, let's just say 50% probability trade. So the bull put spread and the put sales are high probability, like 90% and up limited reward. This strategy is a high reward, large ROI, 50% probability. Steve, I'm getting there, my man. Mark says, high reward, especially if you add positions on pullbacks. Yeah, totally. Let's go through an example. In this example right here on Apple, we are buying to open a long-term call option. So an example would be buying a 160 call expiring in two years. Two years, Newsom, I don't want to wait two years to make money. My friends, true or false, if you buy an option that has two years of expiration, you can sell it whenever you want. And the answer is true. So if you buy an option that's expiring in two years, can you sell it next week for a profit or for a loss? The answer is yes, you can. All right, cool. So we kind of got that noted. Okay, so that's what we're doing in this example is we're buying a 160 two-year call option. Is that going to cost money? <sighs> Obviously it will because you're buying it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to sell to open a shorter term call option. Example, the 180 call option expiring in June. So again, we're in April, early April. So we're going to sell the 180 call option for June. Let's kind of walk through this. This is known as a debit spread. Now again, a debit spread is just a type of spread. You have debit spreads and you have credit spreads. 
These are all debit spreads initially. It will cost you money. And ready for this? It does not need margin. But you do need a higher level of option approval to do this particular trade. But I'll say it again, you do not have to have margin to do this particular trade, at least here in the United States, in my personal experience with the brokers that I've used in my trading. Victor says, is it hard to get option approval from the broker? Not really. What I would say is you might have to do a white lie on some brokers and tell them that you have a lot of experience trading options for them to give you option approval. But some brokers, AKA most brokers, you just have to ask for it and they'll kind of give it to you. But if you say, yeah, I want super, super, super safe investing. No risk for me. Give me treasury bonds all the time. You probably won't get option approval if you do that. All right. Because the brokers are like, well, yeah, you shouldn't trade options then if you want treasury bonds, 8% return over 467 years type of returns, you probably should not trade options. Victor says, how about margin approval? That's literally a click of a button. <laughs> Maloney, we're getting there, my dear. She says, what happens if your sold call goes in the money? We're going to talk about that. Chief says, just tell them that you have real life trading experience. That'll do it sometimes. <laughs> it can. All right, sweetness. We are making memories and magic come true. Now, in this example, you own the $160 call option. True or false, call options go up when the stock goes up. Now, for a lot of you, I'm asking really basic questions. But remember, even though this is an advanced section, there's 90% of you have never heard this material before and don't know it exists and you're learning it for the very first time. One of my skills in life is taking very complex things and making it simple because at some point you don't need to know all that much about options. You can, if you want, learn literally as much as you humanly can afford to learn mentally. But if you know this, you can make money. Do you know this, that call options go up when a stock goes up if you buy enough, enough time? Lucas says, from this 160 call, how much do I spend? It just depends on how long you buy the option. So Lucas, true or false? If you buy an option that, caught, that expires in a week or a year, the year costs more money. What do you think, Lucas? True or false? Vitaly put in true. Lucas put in false. You are incorrect, my friend. The answer is true. So it's an insurance contract. If you spend more money on insurance to buy longer time, it's always going to cost you more money because you're spending more money. Yep. Great question. So simply put, it just depends. Um, on this particular option, I'm sure I could look it up really quick, but if I had to just guess off the top of my head, it would probably be about $3,600 to buy one 160 call option with two years of expiration. Uday says, was it better to buy a call option instead of Tesla when we were bullish on Tesla or other expensive stocks? Better is not the right answer. It is, uh, sorry, it's not the right word. It's simply less expensive. Simply less expensive, that's all. It's not better, it's just less expensive. All right, so let's go through this. Remember, we have a 180 sold call. So your sold call option goes down as the stock goes up. I'll say that again. Your sold call option goes down in value as the stock goes up. I mean, it means you're, you're going to begin to lose money on that option. You'll be in the red. So as the stock does this, the option will be negative P&L. Because if you sell something, if you sell a call and you sell it for $2 and the stock goes up, the option will increase in value. Because a call option is the right to buy. And if a stock goes up, the right to buy becomes more obvious. 
Therefore, the insurance contract goes up in value. Here's the purpose, Steve, of selling the call is to reduce your purchase price of the long-term call and get paid to be patient while the stock potentially trades sideways. Because again, think about it this way. If I buy an option and this option costs me $36 and I get paid $2 to sell an option up here, how many of those options do I have to sell before I technically own this option for free? And the answer is 18 months. And is 18 months less than two years? Yes, it is. So if you do it the right way, technically, theoretically, and usually uh, with the right practice and the right timing, you can actually pay for your option on the long-term trade and actually own it outright. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool, Rob. Pretty cool. That's a true statement. Now, let's go forward a little bit. <laughs> Rob says, mind blown GIF. So here's the bounce. So again, some obvious questions. Did the stock bounce, ladies and gentlemen, yes or no? Did the stock bounce? Yep, stock bounce, absolutely. Next, would our long call that we purchased, Lucas, would that be up in value, yes or no? Would that have increased in worth? Would it be worth more money now than when we bought it? All right, everyone's throwing in yeses. Beautiful, that is the correct answer. It is yes. At this juncture in time, would the short call option that we sold, would it be going against you? Would you be losing on that trade? And the answer is yes, you would. Now notice you're not at 180 yet. You're not at 180 yet, but since you sold the call option and the stock has obviously gone up in value, right? You would be losing on that option. Now, remember it's still April. So is the option, is the sold option still out of the money? Yes or no? And the answer is yes, it's still out of the money. But even though it's out of the money, it would still be a red negative P&L balance on your positions tab. Because again, when you sell a call and the stock goes up, the sold call will begin to increase in value. And you will have a negative P&L on that sold call. Therefore, my dear friends, the next question would simply be, do we still have time on that call option before it expires? The answer to that question is yes, right? Because we sold a June call and now we're just coming into late April. So we have time. All right, let's ask another really basic question. Could Apple do this and we don't care at all? And the answer is yeah. As long as Apple is not above 180 come the third Friday in June. What happens if the sold call expires in the money at expiration? You will get shares shorted in your account. That's what will happen. <laughs> so a really quick story for me, I learned this the hard way by getting a margin call. <laughs> um, my broker called me. It was like, hey, Jeremy, uh, you need to deposit $300,000 if you can uh, by Monday. That'd be great. And I was like, yeah, sh sh why? <laughs> that sounds a little much. 
for me, like at this point, like why, why is that? So this was years ago. I mean, even now, honestly, 300,000, I'd still be like, what? Why do I have to put in 300K? But this was eight years ago, nine years ago. So I was buying calls on the SPY and I had his trade just like this. Long calls on the SPY, short calls against it, different expiration. SPY closed in the money on uh, 30 contracts. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It sure did. 30. And um, I mean, this is, you know, again, when SPY was a lot cheaper than it is now, but still, it was a lot. So I called the broker. I was like, well, hey, man, I have a long call option. Like, how come that long call option didn't protect it? And they're like, well, didn't protect it because you have a different expiration date. And I was like, but yeah, but I have the right to buy the shares. And they're like, sure you do, but you can't afford the shares. So there's a problem here. I'm like, yeah, this is a, that's a good point. So more or less what I had to do is talk to the broker, pay an assignment fee, um, yada, yada, yada. But on Monday, I had to exercise the call option. They exercised it for me. I did have shares shorted in my account. And when I exercised it and bought the shares back, it was actually uh, 20 or 30 cents lower. So I actually ended up making like $47 on the entire trade, but it could have been an absolutely astronomically unrecoverable loss in like two and a half, three weeks if I did not do that. It could have gotten bad. So bottom line, this is the real What's the word I'm looking for? Like the module, the story. It starts with an M. Moral. Here's the moral of the story. <laughs> moral of the story is actually if you have an option that ever expires in the money, ever, something will happen to your account. Something, something somewhere. Shares, like if you have a put option on a stock and the put option expires in the money and you have those shares, the broker will sell those shares. If you have a long call that expires in the money, your broker can and sometimes will buy the shares of that call option for you in your account. If the option is out of the money, nothing happens. It's all good. Just It goes options heaven. You'll never see it again. But if it's in the money, something will happen to your account. Just like if you have a long stock position and you have a sold call and the sold call expires in the money, your shares will get sold because it's a covered call. Type in a one if you're okay with that. And I will pause here for a second and answer any questions. Albert says, can we ask the broker we do not want to exercise? Um, in advance, you can, but they'll just tell you to sell the option. So if you're talking to them in advance, um, but if you do options approval and you say, yep, highest speculative growth possible, I'm Mr. Moneybags or I'm Mr. Moneybags, I got plenty of liquidity and years of experience, you're going to get those shares. <laughs> so again, you could get out before it gets in the money. You can always do something right before the market closes, right before everything actually expires. I've closed options seconds before market close many, many times. So again, that's kind of um, just a little, little, piece of insight insight. All right. Aaron says, what was the assignment fee? I think the assignment fee was $45 for them to do all that work for me. Chief says, how about typing a five for whoever had options put to them? Yeah. Type in a five. If you ever had an option put, you know, stocks put to you from an option. Now, again, if you don't mind owning the shares and it doesn't matter, but in this situation, this is generally, if you're long a call and you have a short call against it, you have a calendar call spread. That call, if it expires in the money, you will short shares in that account. And that's generally not what you want. So 
Great, great questions. Okay. Now, going back to this example, did the stock on Apple, did it roll over? Yes or no? It did. Yep. So it got to a resistance. Is that massively surprising? And I would argue, uh, not really. <laughs> it traded to a resistance and sold off. Okay. Would our long call be up in value? Yes or no? And the answer is no way, Jose. Not now. It was. You were profitable, right? Because we bought it here and it went all the way up to here. We're like, woo, oh, dog, man, I'm making all kinds of money. And then bloop, that happened. And now you're not making as much money anymore. Now the 180 call option is down in value. So the short call, would the short call be making you money? Yes or no? And the answer to that question is yes. Now your sold 180 call is making you money because the stock is down much lower and that option's even farther out of the money. So is the sold option, the sold 180 call, is it still out of the money? Yes or no? And the answer is yes, obviously it is. Do you still have time before it expires? Yes, you do. Could you buy the close the sold call back for a profit right here? Could you do that? If you're in the call option short and you want to simply buy it back, exit the trade, realize a profit, could you do that? Roger, Roger, 10-4, that is an affirmative. And again, to remind you, do we still have tons of time on the long call? The answer is yes, it's only been a month. So in your opinion, should we hold this long call on Apple? All right, so you guys all saying yeah. Perfect. Now, we could also, as you all mentioned, we could do it again. So stock bounces. Woo! Yeah, all right. So what you'll notice is you'll see that 180 actually did become deep, deep, deep in the money because this is now May. Lucas says long options and short options should always have the same expiration date. No, they don't have to, Lucas. That's the point of this particular module. They don't have to. It is safer if they have the exact same expiration date, but they don't need to. Rob says, what's the profit look like on this bad mamma jamma? Good. Profit is good. <laughs> Victor says, can you explain what out of the money means in simple words? Sure. Uh, it means that the stock price is not there yet. Terry says, if you have an option that expires on Friday, it means you have until 4 p.m. on that date to exercise your option. Correct. Let's see if Victor got the out of the money thing correct. So Victor, if I said that the stock is not there yet, would a would 160 put be out of the money? Answer is yes. Yes, it would because stock is way up here and put would be at 160. Indeed. Uday says, why then not buy and sell puts? Why calls? Good question. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's see if you can answer the question for Uday. Uday, what is the trend on Apple that we're looking at right now? What is the trend? Trend is bullish. So for me, it's a lot easier to buy calls at low levels and ride it up. For me, it's easier to buy calls here and here and over here. It's easier for me to buy calls there than buy puts here 
and make money on the downside. That's just me and how I see things. Obviously, you would have made a lot of money or some money buying puts in the red circle. But I just prefer buying calls in the green circle. Yep, that's what I got. Arnold, I'll make your comment to all panelists and attendees rather than just all panelists. All right, so that was good. So the stock bounced. Trade went higher. Company went higher. Beautiful. Here is how I personally trade diagonals. Uday says, but you could sell a put for a long. Yep, we Talked about that. You might've come after we did the examples of selling puts on that exact same chart. But yeah, you can absolutely sell puts. Sure. Lucas says, so buying calls is for bullish trends. That is correct. Indeed, sir. So again, this is how I generally trade long call diagonals, which is what the strategy is that we're talking about. I generally buy out of the money call options on stocks that are in strong uptrends. And I buy as long as I can on the option. Now, when I say generally, if the stock is really, really cheap, I say cheap is $40 and under. Um, I'll buy at the money or in the money. At the money or in the money. So if the stock is at, you know, let's just say $25, I'll buy a $20 call option because it's really not that massively pricey. But on really expensive stocks, I'll say expensive stocks is anything over $100. I will generally buy out of the money calls on stocks that are in strong uptrends. And I buy as long as I can on the option. Arnold says, can we combine a leap call with a front month short put? Yes, you can. Indeed, that's just, a bullish position, very strong bullish position. But yep, absolutely. So again, this is just what I generally do when I talk about long call diagonals. So again, buy out of the money, calls on stocks that are in strong uptrends, and I buy a lot of time. Second part, after I buy the long call option, I wait two to three months before I sell any calls against it. I'll repeat that twice. I wait two to three months before I sell any calls against it to see if my trade is working. Hopefully I bought my calls at support. I wait two to three months after buying long calls to sell any call options against it to see if the trade's working. If the trade's not working, then I can start implementing some other avenues. But if the trade, if the trade shows signs of life, if the trade shows signs of life, then I will continue to own that trade and I'll figure out other ways to sell calls against it. Or maybe not. Maybe I don't sell calls at all. Maybe I just wait it out. Jose says, do you always buy calls on stocks that you own the shares of? No. Generally, I, that's the exact reason that I do this trade. So generally, I buy calls on stocks that I don't own at all. Because if I already own the stock, then I'm making money if it goes up. So thumbs up, all is good. I generally buy call options on stocks that I don't own. Edward says, how do you determine if you sell a call against it versus when the trade is not working? How do you determine if you sell a call against it versus not when the trade is working? I think we'll do some examples of that. So keep that question in the pockets in case I don't answer it. Arnold says, if you own the stock, it's like paying yourself dividends. Selling calls, yes, for sure. But I don't necessarily own stock and buy calls on the exact same stock unless I'm really, really bullish on it. Because if, if I already have long stock, then, you know, if it goes up, it goes up. Now, the call I sell is always above resistance of some kind, or at least at all time highs. Generally, it's a place that I do not think the stock will go.
the call I sell is always above resistance of some kind and at a place where I do not think the stock will go. Maloney says, do calls pay dividends? No, they do not. That is a great question, but they do not. That's why I'll buy call options a lot of times on stocks that don't pay dividends. If I do like buying a stock, let's say Netflix, right? Netflix doesn't pay dividends. Amazon doesn't pay dividends. Google doesn't pay dividends. Facebook doesn't pay dividends. I will still buy shares, sure, but I just like trading options. Apple, on the other hand, Costco, Procter & Gamble, Johnson Johnson, Walmart, if I'm going to play those, I'll play them with shares because they do pay dividends. So, yep, it's not, not a silly question at all. Remember, my friends, this is a judgment-free zone. So just ask the question if you have it. You know, might as well. It's good to know. All right, cool. So let's go through a real-life trade that I did. This is a trade I did with real money in real life. Um, give me three seconds because I'm trying to find if I have, where did I put this? I didn't, okay. I'm gonna edit this part out. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna open up a video that I did. If you go to reallifetraining.com and click on blog, you can actually type in debit spread. And I have a good article on this. So the things I'm talking about right now, the debit spread explained in detail. What I'm going to do just for some social proofing is I'm going to open up a video of the trade that I'm explaining right now, just so you can kind of hear and see um, how it plays out. So let me just make sure that you guys can all hear this. A little bit of social proofing, but I think it's relatively important when you are um, trading the stock market. So I don't know. Here we go. And Caterpillar doesn't look terrible. Next on the list is NVIDIA. And holy beep, NVIDIA was so nice today. Just straight up beep, amazing gap. Falco has a put sale. And like I said yesterday and on Friday, full disclosure, I am in calls on NVIDIA. Uh, those are June 2020 calls. JL got four R's on NVIDIA. Congratulations, holding buddy. The most no-brainer buy I've seen in my life, I think. And I'm almost not saying that with exaggeration. I mean, come on. Look, look at this. It finally made it down to the 200 simple. This is it on NVIDIA. Time to go long, folks. Right? My boy Bob has 135 foot sales. Scott says Moon Lambo. Yes. This is it, man. Get ready to rock. I am not bearish on NVIDIA any longer. Let's crush. So we could make one other low. Like we could dip down. I'm not saying we can't go lower than here. But I will only be looking for longs on NVIDIA unless we close below 120. So I know that's a long way away from right now, but at this level, where we're at, the candle, the volume, all that stuff, it's almost too perfect. So I'm kind of like, nah, there's no way it's gonna just crush from here. Theoretically, tomorrow we could get a bearish candle and that would be what's called a three line strike. A very rare candle pattern that I never talk about. Unless we close, like I've been saying on the whole market, if we're going to get a sell-off, it's going to have to happen tomorrow. If we get this just cataclysmic, insane bearish move and it happens tomorrow, fine. We're, we're going to get some pain out there in the market. Otherwise, this should be it. This is the location. I'm looking for a gap up, some type of continuation, some type of move, move on NVIDIA. Again, I am in June 2020 calls on NVIDIA. Uh, those are $200 calls. And I know they're very far out of the money. They're not very expensive. And if NVIDIA, keyword if, does this, then I might buy my own moon Lambo. This is a Lamborghini that you can drive on the moon. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but uh, we will see. So taking a risk, it's not a very expensive risk. You can, for 1300 bucks, you can buy, I think four, or you could have bought four of those contracts. 
think now May can buy three of them. But yeah, looks good. And buy low, sell high off the 200. Loving. The All right. That was it. So since I'm here, we're talking about it. I figured, what do you guys think? Is that relatively clear on what I was doing and saying and thinking and how I felt about NVIDIA at that particular point in time? <laughs> I was pretty clear on it, right? Yeah. So. I mean, that was the trade of trades. So that was, it has not been my most profitable trade as far as dollars is concerned, but that was my most profitable trade as far as return on investment. Um, I believe those particular options. So again, I bought deep out of the, uh, very far out of the money options. And um, yeah. I think they were about 10,000% return, give or take. <laughs> 10,000, that's correct. Yep. Um, let me see. I don't, I can't find those. Um, Robin, do you mind messaging me those in Slack if that's possible? I just can't track those down. Let me see if I click this. Okay, yeah, if you can Slack it to me or message it to me in here, that'd be great. Uh, so really quick, I'm just gonna go through this particular kind of like notation. Um, so again, on that particular day, that video that I just played, this is when I bought some June 230, I did some 220, I did some 200, I did shares, I did put sales, I did everything. Everything? Everything. I got in. Because again, I'm not saying it could have won or didn't win or shouldn't have won. It was just a trade where I had to do it. It was a very good support at an extremely strong level. Um, is NVIDIA a company that pretty much everyone here knows exactly how they make money? And the answer is it, it should be. <laughs> um, should be. Mark says, no pinky toes, just full on head first. Yeah, this was in to win this was a party and i had all the queso to myself i had queso and guacamole and just deliciousness so anyway all i'm getting at is it was a really really bullish event so let's just again kind of walk through it as I'm looking at this and kind of getting an idea of what's happening at this support, my general feelings on this is simply, you have a beautiful, beautiful support level, one white soldier, morning star, out of support, off of the 200 simple, on a weekly chart. It was just so much goodness. And the option cost $3.40 per contract. $3.40 per yeah pretty sick huh 340 per that's 340 dollars a contract so if you had bought one of them just one right at this exact moment in time that option's worth about approximately 1300 dollars Maloney says they're worth 122 right now. There you go. So, you know, not bad. It's not bad. Now, again, when this happened, did the trade begin working immediately? Yes or no? Yep, it did. So it started working immediately, it started bouncing. So we, did I sell calls against it immediately? No, I waited because I got in and as per, I just mentioned, it sometimes takes, you know, two to three months before I do anything. So here is the next trade um, here. So a month later, a month later, again, I normally say, I know two, three months, but a month later it was working, but it had this huge, huge gap up. Massive, massive gap up. 
bull candle gapping up and at open on that day, I thought to myself, you know what? We're gapping up so big. I figure might as well sell a call against it. Now, what I did is it was a little, a little handy pandy. I don't even know what that means, but I sold a shorter expiration, uh, closer to expiration situation in this trade. So what I mean is I sold a 200 August call. So if you notice on the chart where I'm at, right? So if you notice on the chart, I sold the August $200 call. So is 200 lower than 230? The answer is obviously yes. So this was technically a bear call spread, theoretically, because I had a sold call lower than my long call. So I sold call lower than my long call. So it was technically a bear call spread. So again, um, I know the risks of that. I'm okay with the risk for that. That's not that big of a deal. But if the stock did really, really go higher, if they just started skyrocketing to the moon, then I would have had to buy back the call, but I was able to bring in a dollar. Right, so the option that I purchased was already up almost 100%. So I bought it at 340 and some change. At that point, it was about 540 and some change. So a month later, I, um, again, it's up almost 100%, and I sold an option against it, bringing in a dollar. All right, cool. So at that point in time, oops. So at that point in time, going a little bit forward, did the 200 August call expire out of the money? Yes or no? All right, so this is the red circle. This is the expiration. And you can all see $200 is here. So since the stock is well, well, well below, it expired out of the money and I kept my dollar of premium. Another month and a half goes by and we traded to another resistance. So at that point in time, I did the exact same thing. I sold a $200 October call option. And that brought in about a dollar and some change. Did the $200 October call option expire out of the money? And the answer is yes, because if you go all the way till November, that's when it finally hit 200 in November. So come October, the October 200 expired out of the money, but it got close. It got really close. Woodshed Williams is doing the math. He goes, now your long call only costs $140 per contract. Type in a one if that's pretty epic. That's how I lowered my... ROI so much is I was chipping away at the actual purchase price of the call option. Heck yeah. That was sick. That was really cool. Terry says, so you're selling to offset the buy costs. Bingo. Yep. Bingo. Now, is it always going to be that clean? No, this, I mean, I am using the, one of the best examples possible. <laughs> so I'm really cherry picking here. Okay. But it was a real trade. I mean, I did it. Um, we had, well, I mean, I had four or five coaching students make four or five figures on this one trade. So anyone who was coaching with me at this time, I told every single one of them to be in NVIDIA long. I said, buy as many shares as you want, as many calls as you want, sell as many puts as you want. Be very, very bullish on this shit. Because it's NVIDIA. Nelson says, really good way to explain it. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, you're welcome, man. So again, did I get very lucky? Yeah. Steven says, how do you know how many to sell? Well, that's really easy. You just sell however many contracts you own against. So if you own one contract, you're going to sell one contract. 
Yeah, that's really easy. Mm hmm. Now, without blowing your mind, again, I don't want to go too down far down the rabbit hole, but if you own five contracts um, and you sell 10 contracts, uh, you need margin, number one. But this is now called a calendar ratio spread. Oh boy. Don't even get me started on ratio spreads and back spreads and all that stuff. But you can technically do it, but you would need margin. Now, if you owned five and sold two, that's still called a ratio spread, a ratio calendar spread, but it would not It would be a uh, non-margin required spread if you sold less than you owned, which I, I have done that as well. So now I want to walk you through a trade that uh, a lot of us did together, hundreds of real life traders. And this is a very recent example. This company is Walt Disney. Type in a one if you know what Walt Disney is. <laughs> a little bit of a joke, but all of you guys know what Walt Disney is. So Walt Disney, is it out of support at this point in time? Yes or no? It is. Right? Did it have a big drop? It does, right? It has a big drop. Um, does Disney make money and are they a big company? And do you know exactly how they make money and all that good stuff? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. So at that point in time, I'm like, okay, well, Disney's out of support. I'm excited about going long on this trade. It's in a bullish uptrend long term. So if I get, if I come over here to a monthly chart, this is a monthly chart. Right. Is, is Disney in a uptrend? And the answer is yes. Maloney says, wouldn't you think that it would have broken that support? Um, I mean, just because I have a line drawn on the screen doesn't mean that it has to bounce there. I was literally visualizing Disney being at 150 and going to $77 in a month and a half. <laughs> it just seemed a little too steep for me. I mean, I'm you know, COVID shutdown, markets, global economy, whatever. I mean, regardless of whatever caused this drop, it's kind of irrelevant. That's a large, large, large drop. So worst case scenario, I was expecting this in the market. Because so it's still in a demand zone. There's still people that are buying it down here, right? This was just, a, I mean, look at the volume. Volume was like the, the highest volume that it had ever had other than this and this. And what did both of those volume spikes cause it to do? Right? Both of those ginormous bearish volume spikes, the stock is higher weeks later. So the bears got exhausted. They're showing up to the party with a bunch of mocktails, you know, like those kinds that you get at the grocery store and they're just all pina colada with no booze like that's what they're doing there ain't no one left party's over like why are you bringing this if i'm drinking a pina colada i'm either gonna have alcohol in it or just not gonna have pina coladas so <laughs> if i just want a giant amount of sugar like i'm just gonna have a cheesecake or a milkshake like what's what's the point so makes sense because again, at this point, my friends, it's still technical analysis. It doesn't matter what instrument you use. It is still technical analysis. Buy low, sell high. When a market has a, I mean, from 150 to 77 on Disney, unless I'm just really, really messing up the math, that's approximately 50% sell-off in a month and a half. So... Anyway, this is a trade that we all did. So next, zooming into, this is a daily chart. So what we were just looking at, my friends, was a weekly chart. So let's just kind of analyze all this together. Number one, is this a strong hammer candle? If we're going all the way back to the beginner's class, all the way back to the beginner, module two, is that a hammer? 
Yes, it is. Is it a strong hammer? Yes, it is. Could this be construed or argued as a double bottom? Yes, it could. If it is a double bottom, did we close above what could be argued as the neckline of this particular pattern? Are we at a support zone? Yes, we are. Did we really have a bearish candle closing below that support zone on the daily chart? And the answer is you had one. And then the very next day was a white candle and then we were higher. You guys see what I'm doing? If you went to the back trading marathon with me, what am I doing right now? If you went to the back trading marathon with me, I'm stacking the odds. I'm, st I'm just going through it going, yep, 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 yep. If I do enough yeps, I'm like, all right, well, I'm getting in, <laughs> especially if it's longer term. So speaking of the back train marathon, if you guys want, go to reallifetrain.com and click on online courses and come down here to the back trading. If you have not take this course, please do so. It's awesome. I say that as humbly as I can. It is legit. I was on 100% Newsome Juice all day long. If you want to see me in peak element for six straight hours, this is it. Anyway. <laughs> Albert says, if you're serious about trading, that's a very good point. Yes, yeah, that's true. If you want to do this and make money, then do that class. If you're just like, eh, I'm just here, then you probably don't want to do that because that is, man, that's intense. But anyway, bottom line, long story short, we are stacking the odds at this point. Jose says, how many marathons have you done this year? Probably a few. Uh, the back train marathon, I've only done one of them. Actual physical, like in-person marathons, I've done 10 so far this year. Um, all of them coming since April. <laughs> so I've done 10 marathons in the last two months. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Arnold says, are you going to do another one? I will at some point. Yeah, I, honestly, I'm just trying to figure out how to structure it. What I'm thinking about doing the next one is I'm thinking about doing a how long can I go marathon and have people like bet on it and make donations if I go certain time periods. It's like a raffle or something. So <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. I just won't drink any water for like, you know, weeks, days before. I, I don't know. Anyway, so it'll be fun. Okay, bottom line, blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Here's the point. This stock looked good. Okay, it looks nice. It was a decent trade. So what I did was on this particular day, I bought some 140 June 2021 call options. Why 140? Mm, literally just that. I'll just pick the number. Just, it was random. I want everyone to know that there was nothing special. It could have been any number above hundred. It was not that expensive, but my friends, do I have a lot of time on it? Yes or no? Cause again, this was, this was recently. So if you're watching this in 2020, I mean, this happened weeks ago. This is very fresh. If you're watching this in the future, sorry, you missed this trade, but there'll be other ones. So June, 2021, 140 call. And at that time, it was approximately $3. <laughs> three bucks. So that's $300 per bet, right? And the way you lose money on that trade is if Disney doesn't go higher in the next year and a half. Albert says, you got three? Yeah, man, three. Okay, so next few days, here's what we did. We retested again. So type in a seven if this is a clear, obvious, no-brainer, unquestionable retest of that neckline. 
I mean, this is straight out of the textbooks. So boom, 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 bang, retest. Now at the moment, you're probably scared to buy it. You're probably terrified. You're like, oh no, I'm, I'm not, I'm scared. But here's your retest gap. We talked about retest gaps in the intermediate series. Retest gap, white candle gapping up. Did it retest? Yes, it did. Is this a bullish candle? Yes, it is. Are we retesting the neckline of a double bottom? More than likely, yes. Is Disney a good stock long-term? Yes, it is. Do we retest the retest gap? Yes, we have. Are we holding this support a few days later? Yes, we are. What should we do? Probably being bullish. So I bought another one. And then we started bouncing a little bit. And so we've made some higher highs and some higher lows. Then we started trading sideways for a little bit. So I bought a few more. So I bought some at three, some at four. I started buying some around four and a half, five in this general vicinity. Uh, just kind of, you know, tiptoeing in. And then this is when I went, I really went heavy. So earnings come out. Look at this bear volume. Earnings come out. Jay says, I wish I watched this two months ago. Yeah, man. I mean, we were in this, this was weeks ago. So we were, there's still traders in this position. But yeah, we were, um, we were in this one for sure. Here's your bearish volume. What happens the very next day? Who can explain this one to me? The very next day. All that volume comes in. Pretty bearish indecision candle. And then boom sauce. We closed above the high. We trapped the bears and it's Disney. So what I do? I bought some more calls. Because again, it's June, 2021. We have a year to go. We have a year. So I'm like, all right, well, I've been in and it's working, right? Because remember, I bought some at three and four and now I'm buying some at five. Is it working? Like, well, yeah, technically, because it's higher than where I bought it for. So theoretically, it looks like it's working to me. So I bought some more. And then this happened. And what's really cool on that particular day is those options were now worth $9. So what I do? I sold them. <laughs> I unloaded the boat. It was a trade that mathematically seemed very highly probable. So if I bought some at three, I bought some at four, I bought some at five, and now it's at nine. Uh, yeah, let me, I'm just going to sell it. And that was a really profitable trade. Nothing, nothing insanely weird. I mean, you could have made a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. I don't specifically know any trader that made over a hundred thousand dollars on this trade. I'm, I'm a hundred percent confident someone in the world did, but I don't know that person. But again, it was just like a normal good trade that you had to be in because it just made a lot of sense. This was a trade that we did in the afternoon swing trading rooms through the course of April and May. Right. And so again, if at any point in time you have an interest in trading with me and finding trades like that ever so often, once a month, once a quarter, Go to reallifetrading.com, click on live trading, and uh, you can access any of the trading rooms if you want. I mean, honestly, folks, the afternoon room where I do that analysis is only $199 a month for now. I mean, $199 a month, so that's truly one good trade. If you're watching this and you have more than $20,000 liquid that you can trade, it's a no-brainer. That would be, that, that's one R. That's 1%. If you have more than 20,000, in any account, at any point in time, anywhere, and you're not in the afternoon room, uh, I, you should be. It just make math. It makes mathematical sense to me. 
Now, granted, all these positions that we've been talking about so far, uh, these are bullish, but what happens as the stock goes down? So keep in mind, I generally do not craft many of these. Oh, that's a good question. Cindy says, does your long leg need to be at least one year out to sell options against it? No, you do not. Nope, it does not have to be that long at all. Great question. So again, these are bullish. What happens if the stock goes down? So again, I generally don't do a lot of bearish trades. I'm a perma bull. Uh, and yeah, I lost money in March, but I flipped and started getting some of it back and then it all, it all worked out. But you can absolutely do this with bearish trades. Bear, you could do a bear call spread as a calendar and you could do what's called a long put diagonal. Let's just go through some of those examples. Again, full disclosure, I do not do many of these. Macy's is just the stock that I think of. It's just, you know, this thing's going, this is plummeting. So when this support breaks down, what could you have done? And obviously the answer is you could have gotten into all kinds of things. So here's something that you could have done theoretically. Right? So again, if the stock starts breaking support, remember selling calls is bearish. So you could get into a sold $40 call option with a longer expiration and buy a shorter term call as a protection. I haven't done one of these in a while because the market's been so bullish. But could you? Yeah. So you sell a six month call option and then you buy a two month call option, that would just be a calendar bear call spread. So true or false, my friends, is this a debit spread? True or false, is this a debit spread? False it is a credit spread, yep. So this would be a credit. You would receive money for this trade. So it is not a debit. This is a credit spread. Cindy says, is the buy one always at the next strike price? Nope. You can do whatever strike price you want, really. The farther strike price away, Cindy, just the more expensive it becomes. That's all. Great question. Now, what you could also do is you could have bought a 12 month put. So if you're really bearish on something, you think a stock's gonna really, really drop. There are stocks that drop permanently, you know. You could buy a long-term put option and as it trades to a support and starts trading sideways, what's it called if you sell a put with a different expiration? So again, if you bought a 12 month put and you sold a four month put, you would be in a diagonal bear put spread or a diagonal long put. So you have that long call diagonal and you have long put diagonal. Matthew says, what makes you choose to sell a call over buying a put? Both bearish direction trades. Uh, honestly, man, that's, it's up to you as the trader. It depends on what you like. Selling calls gives you limited return, limited risk, higher probability. Some people love high probability, limited risk, limited return things. They just kind of dig it. Also, you don't necessarily need to be right at all to make money when you sell options. You just don't want to be wrong. If you're like, oh yeah, this stock's definitely going down and it just does this, you can make money by selling call options. But if you really, really think a stock's going to move, if you're quite confident that something is going to be a powerhouse, then trading directional will always make you more money. 
Uh, that's true. Arnold says pessimist or optimist. You can be right. Yep, that's true. Maloney says on certain earnings days on a specific company, if you bought a call and it put and one of them expires worthless, what would that be called? We're going to talk about that literally in the next class. So stay tuned. <laughs> Come back tomorrow for those who are here live. And if you're watching the recording, just click the next button. And I will answer Maloney's straddle question. Okay. So if we're talking through all this, what are the main risks of all this? Because I did make it seem kind of easy. I kind of cherry pick some trades. I do lose on some of these trades, but again, I have a pretty high 73% win loss ratio on longer term um, option trades. The main risks is the stock doesn't go in your direction. <laughs> That's one of the main ones. Uh, the biggest risk is if your short option expires in the money, Something will happen to your account, AKA assignment, AKA margin call, AKA you're hosed. And I'm sorry. And then number three is the stock just goes sideways for three or four months and the option premiums will decline in value. But again, if you want to sell options against your long-term options, if it trades sideways long enough, it's okay. But you're gonna have to hold through some fluctuations. Right, because as the stock trades sideways, that means you're going to be holding through a lot of fluctuating PL. My boy Aaron says, hypothetical question: What happens if you have spreads put sales a lot and it gaps in the money at expiration? You don't have the funds to put those shares. Does your broker liquidate all of your positions? Um. Yeah, I'll say this: the broker. When you sign all that paperwork that no one reads, bro, they're going to get their money. So <laughs> they can come after your house if you ain't got the money in there. So yeah, don't risk that much. It's all about risk control. Your account will be, I mean, you'll get frozen. They will liquidate all of your account. They will take every dime out of that account if you have to. So yeah, it is a it is definitely a hypothetical question, but it can happen. I know a lady um, who went through a course and they they specialize in selling naked calls. So if anyone wants to guess if that company's still in business, as Brad Pitt would say, they are not. <laughs> All right. So that company specializes in selling naked calls because they're always bearish. And uh, you know. They're dumb. But anyway, one of the ladies who took their course, who was not dumb, the instructors were, but she was just listening to what they said, sold a call on a biotech pharmaceutical company. <laughs> oh, man. And it gapped up 112%. And so she calls me freaking out like, hey, what should I do? And I'm like, uh, uh get out like immediately she's like no i think i'm gonna hold because it looks like a good gap it could go lower i'm like um yeah but if it goes higher like do you have any protection like what i mean do you have any position like you could buy some calls you could buy some shares but you're you're gonna lose money out open you're gonna be down anyway you ever have uh they're, they're called ask holes <laughs> you ever have any of those people in your life? <laughs> they just ask all these questions and they never take your advice. Well, this was one of those ladies uh, because I told her specifically what I would personally do in that opinion. I was like, I would either A, exit the sold call for a loss and then buy some shares and buy some call options because it's a very, very strong gap or just get out of the call altogether and lose money and that's it. Um, well, she didn't do that. And her entire account got liquidated. And then the brokers came after her house because she lost 97 grand and only had eight grand in her account. Yep. It got bad because it just, this particular stock, I'm trying to remember. 
Let me see if I can find it. I bet I can, if I think hard enough, I think it was this one. Mm hmm. It was SRPT. Jay says, getting caught naked. That is exactly what happened. She got royally hosed. Um, SRPT, give me a few quick seconds. <laughs> this was it right here. This was it. Man, my memory is unfortunately too good. Cindy says, that's called betting the house. And that's exactly what she did. Now, type in a one if you think she doubled down at some point. Yeah, she definitely did. Probably right after she got off the phone with me. <laughs> I mean, she, I, I should have charged for the phone call. I, I feel like she would have listened. I don't know. She got wrecked. And the worst part of it is, I, don't, I mean, she's not here. I'm looking at the attendees list. So I know she's not here. I, I don't think she trades anymore. I mean, why would you? The worst part is she got a sign out here, right at the top. Maximum pain. I know, out town, because it did actually end up going lower. Yeah, it was brutal. It sucks. It was a really bad position. It's not good. I feel terrible. I really, really do. It was not a good situation. I do not sell naked calls very frequently. The last naked call I sold was on only on a stock that I track very, very often. So on this day, um, I sold a call up here expiring regular June. And I uh, sold that call for $13 and I bought that call back on that day for $3. So I, I do sell options. Um, you know, I do sell calls. I also did a bear call spread uh, on June and I have gotten out of that. And I also did a um, credit spread over here when it started rolling over. And that's what, that's what I made the big money on Tesla as well was on the drop. So again, you know, not being ultra braggadocious, but check out this. Um, this chart kind of helped me a little bit. And this is the chart that I created. So this was my analysis on Tesla. So this is back in February. I posted it in the afternoon room and I told everyone, this is what I'm going to do on Tesla. If it gets back up to 900, I'm going to short it with all my might. Check this thing out. I mean, <laughs> come on. Your boy puts in time, ladies and gentlemen. All right, I do study this stuff. I'm not just here. Man, I wrecked this thing. Oh, whoo, get it. Williams says, I remember that well. You should. <laughs> uh, this is what was funny. I told my boy, Philip Williams, to buy puts, all the puts, before it happened. <laughs> we met in person on this day. I was like, hey, man, if we gap down tomorrow, just Buy as many puts as you can afford and make as much money as you want. Anyway, but I still love you. <laughs> so it was, it was a really cool trade. It's a good move. Um, anyway, let's go back to slides. So those are the main risks, obviously, of all this. I mean, the main risk is you lose money, right? So you're going to lose money. That's the main risk. So don't lose a lot. So the risk of long call diagonals, right? If we're looking at this. So again, if you bought a call over here and sold a call right here, and it's just gangbusters, um, you can lose money, obviously, on that sold call. 
if you're in a strong, strong uptrend and you're just trying to pick the top of your uh, sold call, sell the same expiration. If you're just in a powerhouse of a winner and you're like, man, when's this thing going to stop? I don't know. Well, then cool. Just sell the same expiration and then all is going to be good for you. Because if you do that, there is no risk of assignment and actually everything is okay. Does that make sense? So again, if you are trying to pick a top or a, a pause in a trend that's just absolutely wrecking house, then just sell the exact same expiration and you're gonna be fully covered. It won't be an issue. All is good if you have the same expiration. It can close in the money. And as long as you have the same expiration, it's okay. I'll say that again. If you have a long-term option and then you sell another option with a different expiration, it can get a little tricky if it closes in the money. But if it's the same expiration, you're okay. You are covered. It's not nearly as bad. And it becomes just a regular old debit spread. And it can close in the money and everything will be fine. Cool. Cool. All right. And the next one, the risk of the long put diagonal, obviously, is it doesn't change, ladies and gentlemen, just because you have the strategy. If you get into a long put diagonal right here, are you going to make money? And the answer is no. <laughs> right? <laughs> timing. It's still a timing thing. If you do any strategy at the wrong time, you're going to lose money. If it seems so obvious and simple and there's nothing, it's like, ah, oh, this is just the easiest trade ever. You've probably missed it. If you have a little bit, just like an inch of fear, just like a little bit of fear, you're like, man, I don't know. I might be quite, that's probably an okay trade. But if you're like, oh yeah, look at this, going to get in. Because again, as I was stacking Disney and going through all that, creating the odds and putting the odds in my favor, it still didn't just run high. There were still questions and concerns. And I was like, well, maybe the market's going to roll over and go to zero. I don't know. So there's still a little bit of fear there. But I had to do it because the setup was there. So the risk of the long put diagonals, of course, you know, trade doesn't really work. Now, to answer my girl Cindy's question, because I got you, Cindy. Can you play counter spreads on shorter term time frames, ladies and gentlemen? The answer is, of course you can. Why not? Why not buy a long call right here? And as the stock goes up and you sell a call against it over here with different expiration dates or the same expiration dates, I mean, sure you can. Right? Can you build a plan and a strategy and some rules on when you get into these trades and how you get into these trades and how long you hold and all? The answer is, of course you can. You can build a rule plan strategy for anything. I mean, look at this hammer. Look at the close immediately above that hammer. I mean, if that's not a bullish sign, and that's why we just keep tearing up the charts on the SPY. We had a white candle gapping up, which is a retest gap. We've been retesting. We're just going to keep going bullish right now for a little bit because that's the trend on all time frames. So here are some of my rules. 98% of the time, I only buy leaps on stocks that are in uptrends on the weekly and monthly charts. I say 98% of the time because I'm in one right now. It's not in an uptrend. Carnival. Second rule, I have to be quite confident on the stock long-term. Number three, I really love the trade if I know a lot about the company fundamentally. All right, so there's another one. Uh, number four, is it at support? So let's just go look at one for an example. Let's be, let me pull over Trend Spider and pull up Zoom. Ladies and gentlemen, do you all know how Zoom makes money and do you use the product? <laughs> okay. 
The answer is yes. All yeses because you're in it right now. You're using Zoom as we speak. Is Zoom at a support level right now? Yes or no? And the answer is no, not even close. It's literally at the all time high. It's never been higher. It is the highest that Zoom has ever been ever. This in the green is a support. Support, kind of a support, definitely a support. Buy low, sell high. So I'm not buying call options on Zoom in the red circle. Well, Jeremy, what if it goes higher? It probably will. And then I'm going to miss it. So too bad. What about if I go back to a trade that a lot of traders are in right now that have made some solid, some decent money? So Slack technologies, a lot of people use Slack. And let's just say over here in the green circle, was that at a support? Just, I'm just doing a random example. I would say so, right? You had a resistance, 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 and it pulled back to a support. So yeah, you know, is that a support? Okay, let's do another one. Let's go look at Apple. So if I zoom out on Apple, just big picture really quick. If I go to the weekly chart, look at Apple. Here's your resistance, old resistance, new support. Is that a support? Was that a support on Apple at 225? The answer is yes. Could you have bought a leap on Apple at 225? The answer is you probably should have. I hope you all did. Apple at 225 was the most no-brainer thing of all time. Now, is it a great spot to buy a leap on Apple right now? Hmm, no, because it's out of resistance. Can it go higher? Sure, will it go higher? Probably, but I'm just not gonna buy it right now. <laughs> Brandon says, I loaded the boat at 240 and I got scared, so dumb. Hey man, live and learn. Live and learn. It's Apple, they have more money than you do, so don't worry about it. That's, that's generally what I tell people. They have what's referred to as a lot of cash. They're gonna be all right. Carvana, CVNA. Uh, I'm gonna go look at Carvana. <whistles> Philip Williams, making dreams come true on Carvana. Nicely done. Look at that candle today. Good for you, bud. So if I go to a monthly chart, is Carvana in an uptrend? Yes or no? The answer is yes. Cindy says, why is it in an uptrend? Um, just higher highs and higher lows. Just strong uptrend. Also, this was a Easter egg in the beginner series. If you guys go back, uh, when I was talking about charting a company, I was like, hey, you should chart companies that are in nice, strong uptrends. You know how the companies make money and you should really understand how. So that was in the beginner series, we were looking at Carvana. <laughs> Buying low, selling high, all the way back down there at 25 and some change. Now it's at 110. Man. All right, so again, some more of my rules. You can either buy in the money or out of the money. I buy as long of an expiration as I can at a price that I think the stock could realistically reach. I buy out of the money for more expensive. I buy in the money for cheaper. I hold the stock for one month after I, I hold for one month after I purchase. This is the waiting game. To find out if I'm right, I generally sell six weeks or less of time against my long option. I only sell calls on up days or at market opens on a big gap up. I use finviz.com a lot to do random scans to find companies and charts that look nice. I just go in. Finding the opportunities on the market is the easiest part of trading. I promise you, you're not making, if you're not making money trading, it's not because the opportunities are not there. And it's not because you aren't recognizing the opportunities. Every single person here, regardless of how much money you have or have not made trading, you know that you've seen some opportunities that you did not take because you were scared for some reason, whatever that fear was. It happens to me all the time. 
I don't take plenty of trades because it's some kind of weird random fear, right? Fear of losing, fear of being wrong, fear of missing out, something. So there, it, it happens all the time. But I still do take some of them. <laughs> if the trade's there, I'm like, yep, I gotta, I kind of got to take it. I'll take it. So again, let's go look at some more real life examples. Um, someone asked me to look at Carnival. So Carnival, the reason I put in 98% um, is Carnival in an uptrend on any time frame ever. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you guys think? It's Carnival in an uptrend at all, even remotely. No, it's not. Nope. But I feel like Carnival did trade down to a support. And I think that it could realistically trade back up to 20. So I did buy some leaps on Carnival just because they're so cheap. Like they're like a dollar. I mean, they're really, really inexpensive. So I'm like, well, I'll just take a stab at it. I'll give it a shot just in case. If we can take out the high of this candle, May 27th, we should be okay. And if we do, we start, if we start taking out really these highs, 17 and a half, 17.52, you can make some serious money on Carnival short term. I mean, because this is a higher low right here. Morning star reversal, higher low, volume is increasing. We're making higher highs. We're starting to get above all the moving averages. I dig it. Carnival could absolutely, without question, easily have a very, very nice short in the next two, three months pop up to 23 and some change. And if it happens, I'll make a lot of money. And I'll probably donate most of it because it's, it, Carnival's down like 89%. So it, it's a little bit of a double black diamond, a little bit of a tougher trade, but it looks beautiful. I like it. It looks kind of cool. What else? What's some of the other stocks that you guys want to look at? This is the real life example part. What do you got for me? Starbucks. So SBUX, Starbucks um, pressure building is definitely trading sideways. Uh, monthly chart. Is, is Starbucks in an uptrend on a monthly chart? Yes, it is. Looks good. So it did pull down to a support. Yeah, looks nice. Starbucks, I like it. AMD, bullish uptrend. Yeah, bullish uptrend. I am in bullish on AMD right now. And I love, love, love these two hammer candles. I love this hammer candle. I love the fact that we closed above this hammer candle two days ago. So I'm in AMD bullish and I'm expecting it to, uh, to, pop, to pop, hopefully. Blue Apron, APRN. So Blue Apron is definitely not in an uptrend. I've, I've learned my lesson on this one. I've tried picking the bottom on this one a few times. And I just keep getting it wrong. So this thing just refuses to go higher. Here's the weekly chart, looks okay in the daily chart. So. It did have a beautiful pop yesterday, but that this might be a lower high. I don't know. We'll see. All right, let's go look at Fastly. FSLY is Fastly in an uptrend, ladies and gentlemen. What do you guys think? Yes or no? Is FSLY in an uptrend? Yes, it is. Did you find a new uptrend company with a good gap that you could be long on? The answer is, of course. So Fastly looks strong. AYX, is AYX in a longer term uptrend? Uh, give me one second, let me go to a longer term chart. Is AYX in a long term uptrend, yes or no? Yes, it is. Is it out of resistance? It is, it's out of resistance, right? Richie says, shaking my head. I'm not even gonna tell a story, Richie, don't worry. I won't even embarrass you like that. <laughs> I won't even tell everyone what happened between that, me and you on this trade. But AYX, nice resistance, gorgeous uptrend, beautiful fundamentals, nice company. Uh, at some point, we'll break out, but realistically, I'd love for it to trade back down and then we'll see what happens. Kronos, the chronic, definitely not in the bullish uptrend. Um, broke all support levels. But but I get it. It's been basing for three or four months. There's a chance. Maybe if they come out with a really nice 
joint venture or something. There's a shot that it could go higher. Uh, it would need to close, I think, above 675 maybe. So if it can close above $6.75, maybe has a shot on CRON. Um, this is a stock that I know a lot of people in some call options on long-term. NetEase, AKA Cloudfare, ticker symbol NET. Is this trend currently in an uptrend, ladies and gentlemen, yes or no? Yes, it is. And again, you can do some research to find out what they do, but it's a beautiful hammer. And uh, I know some people in some long-term calls on net. I have a few people that I know pretty closely. They're in some calls on this one. NTNX, this will be the last one. Nutanix, let's go look at it on a monthly chart. Is Nutanix in an uptrend? No. Now it's sideways, that doesn't mean that you can't make money on the trade, but it's just not in an uptrend. So that means I probably wouldn't hold the option forever. I'd probably just sell it at that resistance, buy low, sell high. It looks like a good buying spot. I'm not gonna disagree with that, but it's just not an uptrend. Again, it's just easier to make money when a stock is in an uptrend than fight it because this could easily happen for the next you know, few months on Nutanix and you're just kind of bored out of your mind. It's possible. I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm just saying that it could. Ladies and gentlemen, what a class. What a program. Again, I want to say thank you for everyone who helps me make this possible. All the traders out there who are here live, I truly appreciate your time. Brandon says that rocked. Ladies and gentlemen, if you made it all the way to the end, please rewatch this class as many times as you can because I can assure you, if you nail the pieces and the aspects of the intermediate class, the beginners series, and this, this particular class right here, you can make some insane money. I mean, insane money. So go back and watch it, get it, understand it. Really let the simplicity sink in. Because I want each and every one of you here to be totally financially independent. Financially free. I want you to have the fiscal freedom to do anything you want to do at any point in time for anywhere in the world. That's what I want you to do. I want this to be an achievable goal for you to say, yep, I want to do this. Yep, I want to buy that. Yep, I want to own that. Yep, I want to donate that. Yep, I want to give that to this person, to this community, to this organization, and just be able to do it. Without worry, without calm, without fear, just living in abundance. You see a course online that you want to take and you just buy it. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for all of your kind words. I really, truly do appreciate each and every one of you here. Thank you so much. I have a coaching session coming up in 26 minutes, 36 minutes. And, uh, and then I'm going to shower and then I'm going to go to sleep for the first time in a while. So, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for being here. You're amazing. And believe, believe it or not, if you're here live, uh, we will be back again tomorrow night. Same time, same place. If you're watching this on the recording, all you have to do is click that next button and start the program. And my friends, do me a favor. I know a lot of you do this, but if you can, just tell as many people about real life trading as possible. Let other people know that we're legitimate. We're able to help. We can give this information. If they want to learn how to do this, I have single-handedly seen men and women of all ages from age 19 and some change to 87 and some change, be able to make enough money to do the things that they want to do to renovate their kitchens, to travel to Croatia, to buy a house for their mom, to pay off all of their debt, to invest in real estate. I simply want each and every one of you to obtain the things that you want in life, whatever that is, 
I feel like I can help a lot of people do that because I'm on that journey. That's the journey that I'm on. The journey of growth and self-improvement and assisting other people to achieve their dreams. Thank you everyone for being here. I will see you later and until next time. Love life, live life and trade it.